Let's continue our study as classes as a contract by looking at the game Frogger. Here's our problem statement. Let's consider the design of some classes that we could use to implement the arcade game Frogger. Here's a free version of Frogger to play if you're not familiar with the game. Wikipedia also has a good description of the Frogger game online. Now our Frogger is going to have to be simple. We'll have one frog, one truck for each line for a total of five trucks, and a grid that we're going to use to display Frogger and the trucks on the console. When we go to assemble these things, we need to think about what classes we're going to need and what a class really means. So classes describe the state and the behavior of objects. Data are used to describe the state. Methods are used to describe the behavior. And you can think about the behavior as being which changes in state are permitted. So for example, a legal change of state for the frog would be making a jump to the left or making a jump up or down. The frog isn't allowed to jump on the diagonal. That's a change in state that isn't allowed. It's really important to have a personal prototype for subtle concepts like classes. Now, this could be the array list, the stringer, the string builder. But maybe one of the classes that we described today will become your favorite prototype. Whichever one you choose isn't so important, but it is important that you have a model to use for other classes that we're going to develop as we go along. Classes will eventually make a lot of sense, but at first a lot of people find them confusing. So let's talk about the frog class a little bit. Each frog needs to know where it is, that is its position on the board, and it needs to have a symbol to use to represent it. And that's really all there is to the state of the frog in this game. Now we need to have a way of expressing our designs so that we can look at them without having to read a bunch of code. And something called UML is what we use for it. UML stands for the Unified Modeling Language. There are actually 12 different types of diagrams that are available. We're only going to use one type for this semester. As you advance in object-oriented programming, you will learn these other types, at least some of them. So what class diagrams do is they describe classes before implementation. Now it's really important to describe them before you implement them because that's when you can have the really deep discussions about how the classes should be designed. If you wait until after things are implemented, everybody gets very attached to their implementation and nobody wants to go back and rework things even if it isn't a very good design. Now it does take a lot of discipline to design things before you implement them, but it's a very important discipline to develop because that's what a professional software engineer will need. There are three sections in a class diagram. The top section is the class name, the middle section is the data, and that's what describes the state of the objects, and the bottom section describes the methods, that is the behavior of the objects. UML allows a lot of flexibility, so it's legal in UML to have a class diagram that only has the class name in it, or has just the class name and the data. You're allowed to fit it to the circumstances that you need in the design. So we'll do a lot of that. So here are the rules for UML. It's designed to be a single modeling tool for all object-oriented languages. In other words, this isn't something that's specific to Java. So it avoids any Java-specific syntax. Now that can be kind of annoying. Here's the syntax it uses. For data, it puts the name first, and then a colon, and then the type. And for methods, it puts the name of the method, and then it puts the parameters in parentheses, again the name first, and then a colon, and then a type, separated by commas. Then after the parameters, you close the parentheses, put a colon in the return type. Now to tell you the truth, although this is correct UML, I don't really care so much that you do it this way. I care very deeply that you do design, because that's something that's a critical skill. These little nuances in UML, these aren't so important. Now, formally, UML doesn't show constructors, but I usually do. And the reason is that I found that if I don't show constructors, my students forget to write them. That's a problem because classes without constructors usually don't work the way they should. Here is our first UML for the frog class. So I have frog, which is the name of the class on the top, and then I have the state, which is the row and the column where the frog is going to be located, 
and the symbol that's going to be used to describe the frog on the game board. Now we might do a little more thinking about our design here. There are some things that are shared amongst all the frog objects. For example, the symbol. If we're going to use an asterisk to represent our frogs, we're going to use it for all of the frogs. And so it doesn't make sense to save a separate copy to every single instance. Remember that constants are almost always class data. Think back to things like math.py or math.e. Now, in UML, class data is underlined, but there's no UML symbol for a constant. So what I use for that is all caps. Now, again, this isn't formal UML. This is a trick that I use using one of the Java code conventions to communicate something that isn't usually communicated by UML. So this is what our class design looks like now. Again, it's the frog class. The row and the column, those are instance data. Every object will have its own row and its own column, but symbol, that should be the same for all of the objects in the class. That's class data, and that's why it's underlined. Now our frog class behavior is pretty simple. It can jump to the same column in the next or the previous row, so that would be a method move up and move down, or it can jump to the right or left within a row. That is, move left or move right. Now that we have this method, we can see the complete UML for our frog class. The data is the row and the column, both of those are integers, and the class data is the symbol that's shared amongst all the frogs. Then we have our constructor that constructs the frog at a given row and column, and we can move up, move down, move left, move right. Now none of those methods have any parameters because they're relative to the current position of the frog. Remember, you can't have the frog just jump randomly across the board. He has to move logically from one position to another. Now it's time to implement the frog class. So we're going to create a new class in Eclipse. Now the data goes inside the class, but outside of all of the methods. The class data will be static, and the instance data is not. So here's Eclipse. I'm going to create a new class, which is called frog. I'm not actually going to put javadoc in the class while you watch because it's a little too time consuming, but that is something you would normally do. Now there's a lot of discussion in programming circles about whether instance data should go at the top of the class or the bottom of the class. It's not so important which way you choose to do it, but it's very important that you're consistent in how you do it. So I'm going to put the instance data and the class data up at the top. If you want to put it at the bottom, that's fine, as long as you always do it that way. So our instance data for the frog is an integer for the row and an integer for the column. Our class data, on the other hand, which remember is static, And it's not an int, it's a char. Notice that I have our asterisk in single quotes. Remember, this isn't a string, this is just a single character. The first thing we should do is create our constructor. It's a good idea to do the constructor first and to put it at the top of the class. That's a preference of mine. Once again, you don't have to do things the way I do them, just as long as you keep things organized. So all constructors have the same name that the class has. Now I used R and C for the parameters because row and column have been used for the instance data, and so that will create confusion. So row will be initialized to R, and column will be initialized to C. So what we're doing now is we're setting the values for all of the instance data in the Frogger class. We had only four methods. We had move left. You'll recall the return type on that was void. We had move right. 
move up. And move down. Now in order to know how to change row and column, we need to have a sense of where our coordinate system is. So I'm going to assume that row 0 is at the top of the screen and that row 7, 5 rows for the trucks and a starting and ending row, are going to be at the bottom. You could make other decisions than this. I'm going to assume that column 0 is on the left and the largest column is on the right. So when we move left, we'll go to column equals column minus 1, whereas moving right will be column equals column plus 1. When we move up, the row will be row minus 1. And when we move down, the row will be row equals row plus 1. And that's really all there is to the frog class, at least for now. We'll see some more nuances a little bit later on. Now, we've got a problem here, because although we have a class, we haven't tested it. And that's always dangerous, we know. So one of the ways that we can test it is to put a main program in this class, even though this isn't our main game class. So let's do that. Public static void main string square brackets args. So we need to create a frog object and construct it. So let's put it at position 1010. Now the next thing we need to do is exercise these methods so we can see if the data is being recorded correctly. So for example, we could have while, let's test it 10 times. So we'll start count as zero, I have count less than 10. And we could pick a random number, for example, from math.random, if rand is less than 0.25, let's move right. When we move right, we have to tell it what to move right. So our frog is going to have to move right. Now remember our purpose of doing this is testing. So we need to tell the user where the frog is and that it's moving right. And so we'll take frog.row and then a space frog.column. So let's print out where the frog started. And to be consistent, maybe we should put a comma in there. Now else, if rand is less than 0 0.50, we're going to do something similar, only maybe we'll move left. The bottom line is we just want to make sure we try all the different possibilities here. and make sure that our frog is moving around correctly. Else if rand is less than 0.75, frog.move up. And system out print line. And I notice here that I forgot to change this to left. That's going to make it a lot harder to debug our program if we make mistakes like this. And our last possibility will be frog.move down. And then we'll system out print line down frog.row 
www.bradbrod.com. So, you know, this isn't a very profound program, but it is enough for us to see if our frog is behaving reasonably. So let's run it and see if our frog is happy. Okay, so our program's going crazy, and I'm sure you've already spotted the reason. I forgot to increment count. Okay, so let's try this again. Okay, so it started at 1010, then it went to the right, and notice the row number stayed the same and the column went up by one. That's correct. It went to the right again. Again, the row stayed the same, the column went up by one. When it went down, the row number went up and the column stayed the same. It went down again, the row number stayed the same. And if you follow through this, you'll see that our frog is actually working correctly. There's always the temptation to remove this data, to remove this main program from this class, but it's kind of nice to have these things around. We're probably gonna have to modify this class later and we might like to make sure that it's still working after we do modifications. So if we find it's getting in our way, there are a couple of things we can do. One is called folding, where we just take it and compress it so that it's not taking up the whole screen anymore. Another possibility, if it really starts to cause trouble, is to comment it out. But I usually don't take things like that out because testing code always comes back and is useful again later on. So we tested the frog class by putting a main program in there. It's not gonna be our game, it's only for testing, it's not permanent code really. And we moved the frog around and showed the location. Now the next thing we need to do is design our truck class. Our truck is a little bit different. Its state is the position on the board, which will be the row and column again, and whether it moves right or left. Remember that in Frogger, once a truck starts moving in one direction, it keeps moving in that direction. As far as our behavior, the behavior is actually really simple. It just needs to move. Now, eventually when we get to the game, we may wanna do something like wrap around so that when the truck goes off one edge, it comes on to the other edge. But for right now, we really don't need to do that. All we need to do is keep track of the position on the board, whether it's moving right or left. Here's the UML. Notice we've got a row. Now I've used two columns here. When I was looking at the art on the game, the trucks looked better if they were a little bit bigger than the frog, and so I made them sit on two consecutive columns, the right column and the left column in a given row. That's an artistic choice. You might wanna do that differently. I also needed to keep track of whether they were going to the right or going to the left. So that's what is right does. Now symbol is different in the truck class than it was in the frogger class. All the frogs are gonna use the same symbol, but the truck isn't. If the truck is going to the right, I'm gonna use a greater than sign. And if the truck is going to the left, I'm gonna use a less than. This looks kind of cool in the game, so that's why I picked those. When we construct a truck, we're gonna give it a row and a column, and of course, whether it's moving to the right or to the left. Then the only thing we have to do is move, because trucks stay in one row only their column changes when they move. So this isn't gonna be a very difficult class to implement. So we'll create a new class, which we'll call truck. We put our instance data at the top. So we have a row and a left column and a right column. Remember we had a symbol and we had a Boolean for whether it was going to the right or left. So we have a little bit more instance data here. Now in this case, we don't have any class data. We don't have to put a comment in here showing that it's empty. The user can see that or the programmer can see it. Next, we need to create a constructor. Now we need to give it a row a column, and a Boolean. Now, I've done something here that's not always a great idea. I've used the same name for the parameters that I've used for the instance data. Now, I will show you how to work around it, 
because some people like to do it this way, but probably changing the names of the parameters would be a good choice. Here's how you work around it. When you have instance data, there's always an instance object. This is similar to the implicit argument that shows up when we're using classes. And by putting this in front, what we're telling Java is, hey, look, use the instance data row, not the parameter. So left cow will equal cow, and right cow will equal cow plus one. Now our symbol, on the other hand, is going to be set based on is right. So let's set is right first. You're welcome to change those parameter names when you get your hand on the code if this, this thing is bothering you. And now we need a conditional statement. If is right, now because I didn't put this in front of it, that means I'm using the parameter is right, not the instance data. Well, if the truck is going to the right, the symbol we're going to use is a greater than sign. Otherwise, the symbol we use is a less than sign. Now, one of the things you want to do when you finish a constructor is make sure that every single piece of instance data has been initialized. So we had five pieces of instance data here, and all five are going to be initialized. That's good programming. The next thing we have is our move method. So this is our behavior. Now move will mean different things if we're going right or left. So if is right. Now notice I didn't have to put this in front of it this time. Because I don't have a parameter called is right, there's really no confusion here. You can put this in front of it if you wish to, but it's not necessary. So if we're going to go to the right, then left column is left column plus 1 and right column equals right column plus 1. Now we want both of those things done, so remember we need to put curly braces around it. Otherwise, well if we're not going right, we're going left. So then left column is left column minus 1 and right column equals right column minus 1. We don't change the row, we don't change the symbol, and we don't change the direction of the trucks. So that's all that has to be done in the move method, other than maybe some Java doc. So we've implemented our truck class, we implemented the instance data, the constructors and the method, and we could go and write another main program to test the truck class. Because it's so similar to the frog class, I'm not going to do that here, just to save us a little bit of time. But it's always a good idea to test your classes as you're writing them. It'll really save you a lot of time in the long run. So if we were going to test the truck class, we'd create a main program, we'd construct a truck, move it repeatedly, and show the location. In other words, we'd do the same things we did in the frog class. Oh yes, and we would show the symbol too to make sure we've got it going in the right direction. Now, the last piece that we need is our Frogger board. We're only going to implement the frog and the vehicles on a very small board. It's going to be 30 characters wide and just seven rows tall. Now, the way I picked seven rows was you have five truck lanes and then a safety zone at the top and the bottom. The way I picked 30 characters was just looking at sort of the general dimensions to make sure it was proportional. You don't want it to get too long or to be too short. So those looked okay to me. Now, I'm no artist, and it's a good idea to get people who are artists involved in these designs, because sometimes when programmers do art, it's not so pretty. One thing we need to think about is why do we need a grid at all? Well, we've got a huge problem when we're doing console output, and that's we can't back up. So, for example, if we put the frog in first, we can't go backwards to put the trucks over it. So assuming the frog starts at the bottom of the board, as is typical in Frogger games, we've got a problem. So what we need to do is create a grid that stores a map of where everything is located. Then we can display the grid. In order to display the grid, we need to know how to create a rectangular group of characters. This is something called a two-dimensional array, and we haven't done it previously, so we need to talk about it a little bit. 
So for at each step of time, what we're going to do is clear the grid, then put all the objects in the grid, and then display the grid to the user. And that we will repeat every single step through the game. Now, if you think that, you know, wouldn't it be faster rather than clearing the whole grid to just like erase the current position of the frog and draw the frog in a new position? Yes, it would. But the truth is that compared to the user input being slow, this game is going to be so fast, we're actually going to have to end up slowing it down a little bit just to make it playable. So there's no reason to try to be really efficient. Keep it simple. Keeping it simple is almost always a good programming strategy. If it turns out to be too inefficient later, you can always fix it. So let's talk a little bit about two-dimensional arrays. When you construct a two-dimensional array, here's the code. Now these are going to be two-dimensional arrays of characters because that's how we're displaying our game. So you have character, square brackets, square brackets. So there are four square brackets there. And then the name of the array equals new character. And then you give the number of rows first and then the number of columns and a semicolon. What that does is create something that looks like this. Now the light gray versus the white, that's just a PowerPoint thing. All the cells in the array are the same size, just like they were in a one-dimensional array. The rows are horizontal. So for example, row zero goes all the way across. Here's row one, it's one of the darker gray rows. Row two is here. So notice we're zero indexing here. The columns on the other hand are vertical. So this is column zero. Here's column one, column two. In order to access individual elements, we use two indices, the left one for the row and the right one for the column. So for example, the cell I just indicated, that's in row one and column two. This cell is in row three and column four. And so that's how we use a two-dimensional array. Here's a design for the grid class. The only instance data we need is the character array, the two-dimensional array. But we do need to know the number of rows and columns, and those are going to be constants. We need to construct the grid. Now in this case, because we know the number of rows and columns are constants, we don't need to pass them in as parameters. We need to be able to clear the grid, we need to be able to show the grid, and we need to be able to set it one cell at a time. And those are really the only things that the grid class needs to do for now. So let's go write the grid class. Now this is our third class in the same project. So we started with our instance data first. Here's our class data, final int rows equals seven, and final int cows equals 30. Now remember, class data should always be static. So that means no matter how many grids we create, there's only going to be one copy of rows and columns. Now in this case, it's not going to matter because we're only going to create one grid but it's still good to create these things this way. Later on, maybe we'll have a multiplayer version or something like that where we want to have multiple grids hanging around. And if we do the instance data versus class data correctly at the start, we won't have to worry about it later. So we need a grid constructor. Remember, it had no parameters. We have only one piece of instance data, and so there's only one thing that needs to be allocated. a character array, rows and columns. Now remember, this is a primitive data type, not an object. So there's no two-layer construction involved in this at all. In fact, that's all there is to the constructor. To clear the grid, all we have to do is step through the grid one position at a time and enter in something that can't be seen. A space is a good choice. Now, in this particular case, we're going to need to use two for loops. 
One for loop will go through the rows and the other will go through the columns. So for int r is 0, r less than rows, plus plus r. And then we go through the columns inside that loop. Now this is one of our first nested for loops that we've done. So don't worry too much if this doesn't make a lot of sense to you. We'll do lots more nested for loops a little bit later. So grid of R C equals the space character. And that's all there is to clearing the grid. To display the grid, what we're going to do is just print it to the screen. So once again, we need a nested loop. And you know, it occurs to me that by this time in the semester, we actually have seen nested loops. So these shouldn't be completely foreign to you. So here are nested loops going through the columns one at a time inside the rows. So what we're going to do here is system out print grid of R C. Now we don't want to put any spaces in here because we're just trying to print out the rows of the, the array, but we do need to print a new line every time we finish going through the columns. So that will be system out print line with nothing after it. So all of the columns will be printed out and then afterwards we'll have a new line and that will take us to the new rows. The curly braces here are required. It might not be a bad idea to put another set of curly braces in just to make sure that we support the way this indentation is done. We're going to print out the rows one column at a time then do a print line, and that will take us to the start of the next row. So there's our display method. The only other thing we needed to do was to be able to set a value in the grid. So again, that's a void return type. We called it set grid, and we needed to know which row, which column, and what symbol. The code here is pretty simple grid of row r, sort of bugs me that I made one of those a single letter variable and the other one multiple letters, so I'm going to change that. Let's think about this method a little bit. It would be possible that somebody would ask us to set a row and column location that isn't legal. And we really don't want to do that because if we do it, our code will break. What we should do is check and see if 0 is less than or equal to r and r is less than rows, because those are the valid indices for a row. Now the other thing we need to check is whether columns is legal. So 0 less than or equal to c and C is less than columns. Now you could check those separately if you wanted to. If those two are legal, that's when we're going to set the grid. Now we have to decide what we're going to do if somebody makes an illegal choice. People tend to like to do things like system out print line here, and that's really kind of awkward. Although for debugging purposes, it can be useful because we would not want to set an illegal position on the grid. So for now, let's put that in here, but we may want to remove it later on. There's some more elegant solutions to this that you'll learn as you advance in programming. Usually when you start to debug a program, particularly one that might be a little bit bigger, like this one might be at the end, any help you can get, any way you can make your job easier, is worth it. 
So there we have our set grid method. Of course, all of these classes should be Java docked. So when we cleared the array, we used a nested for loop. Now let's make some observations about what we've done so far. We've created three different classes that are going to be an integral part of a Frogger game. Having more classes actually makes programming easier. You've probably noticed that the logic in those three classes was not very complicated. It was really simple stuff. Well, guess what? That's what having more classes can do for you. The hard part is the design, is figuring out which class should do what. Selecting the classes, keeping the classes as separate as possible. Those are the things that then become the challenge. When the design is good, the implementation can be really simple. So learning good design is a very important goal for a programmer. One way to learn a great deal about design is by looking at the Java API. Remember, those classes have been discussed by hundreds and hundreds of programmers. I'm not saying the designs are perfect. In fact, I've pointed out some places where the designs aren't. But really, in general, they're very, very good designs. So keep programming.